Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, we'll start straight away. So, what is this? It's easy. It's a fitness tracker. Okay. It's the one there on the, on the slides. It's not Obama's. Okay. It's mine. Well, it's the one I'm hacking. And um, well, if you haven't got one and you don't know what those are for, basically, it will. It's a tracker, a sports tracker. So it will tell you how many steps you've been walking. Um, it also acts as a sleep wristband. That's what they advertise it as. So it will, it will tell you if um, the quality of your sleep is good, if you've got an efficient sleep or not. Okay. And um, the display. This is really the entry level uh, sports wristband at Fitbit. Um, it has only five LEDs there, just at the top there. Um, they act like kind of a progress bar, so that you know how far you are from your next goal. Like, I don't know, my next goal is to walk 5,000 steps in a, in a day or 10,000 steps, something like that. It can blink some other, but only the LEDs are like meant to be meaningful for somebody. It can also vibrate, so you can wake up in the morning with it if you want, or wake up just in time to get to my talk. Um, and on this one, you have no altimeter, so if you're hiking on top of the Everest or whatever, well, it doesn't know. Uh, it has no GPS. Those are only on the, yeah, the higher, uh, higher models of, um, of uh, fitness trackers. So actually, you see, it's really um, like, you know, a plastic, plastic stuff there. And if you open it up, this is where you get to a small plastic enclosure there. And that's where you've got all the logics, the electronics, and everything that tells you how many steps I'm walking during the presentation, for instance. Right. And then I tried to open it. I started well with a circle or so, and then my husband came in and he was frightened to see me with that, so he decided he'd do the job. He took that like enormous cutter, and I was frightened for his fingers, and we tried to open it. As you can see, it's pretty tough because it's a very small enclosure. Um, it's plast um, plastic is quite solid. It's difficult to rip through, and then once you've ripped through, it's very difficult not to break what is inside, because what is inside is very fragile. Well, you can see there, um, so I'll move the pointer, it's there, right? Uh, that's the Bluetooth antenna. And here you can see on the, well, the red part there, it's the NFC antenna. And there, if you have good eyes, this, this is the NFC chip, right? So, in the end, we managed to open it without breaking the motherboard. Well, nearly without breaking it, and that's pretty good because some other guys um, of iFixit and 360 Electronics had tried, and they had broken the motherboard, so the, the Fitbit was uh, no longer responding. Here, what we broke, you can see it, whoops, that's next time, is there, it's the few LEDs, so probably it won't be blinking anymore, but at least it should be still working. And there you can see, this is the main chip, so it's an ST and microelectronics chip with an ARM Cortex M3, if I'm correct, on there. You've also got a real-time clock there. This is the tree axle accelerometer, okay, so this is what measures the acceleration on three axes. This is the Bluetooth chip. This is for charging. And then on the other side, well, you've got, you haven't got that much space because the battery here takes quite a lot of space, of course, and you've got the vibrator, right? So then, this is a quiz, just to, this is all for the, the hardware part. Do you have an idea how many trackers have been sold um, 
all trackers uh, combined, not only Fitbit. So 10 million, 40 million, 70 million. Hands up for 10 million. 40 million. A bit more, 70 million. Ah, it didn't count. It looks like it's between 40 million and 70 million, according to you. Well, it's 70 million. Well, according to stats, right? And it looks like it's growing. So it's, it's really massive. The, those are World War uh, stats. And of course, well, we're in a security conference and hacking conference. So uh, the question we have on our minds is, well, can we get it to register um, fake steps, for instance? So that crocodile is suggesting, well, if I work on four legs, uh, will it count for more steps or something like that? That's what we're going to have a look at. So we're going to have a video for that. Um, but basically, I tried to have it register some fake steps. And I'm lazy, like it happens for quite a few hackers. And I, I thought, OK, I'd like it to register um, the steps while I'm just sitting at my desk and working. That would be cool. And that's what I did. So I need my glasses. So yeah, we are first um, synchronizing the, the tracker. That's like kind of the geeky way, I'd say, to, to synchronize it. Of course, if you're on Windows or something like that, there's a, uh, an easier way to do it. But still, it works. <laughs> I synchronize. And I have a look at, at the beginning how many steps I had that day, 38 steps. Not very much, right? And then I attach it to a fan. Yeah, that's stupid. It's a very small fan, like five euros, something like that. And that's at my office. And that's lazy walking. There we go. And then we're going to try and uh, synchronize it again and see how many steps I've been doing. Uh, you know, I've been walking very much, haven't I? Refresh the page. 105 steps. Still on my chair. Um, so that was 67 steps in 45 seconds. That's something like three kilometers an hour. It's not like, you know, I'm really uh, walking very fast, but it's better than nothing, especially when I'm just sitting on, on my chair. I go back to the slides. Now, when uh, it comes to being lazy, to be honest, I'm, I'm really not the, the worst on that kind. There were some other researchers. Look what they did. They attached it to the wheel of their car. That's really great. Um, and the well, they, they ran their car like for 10 minutes, not too fast, look, and they registered. It was something like a little bit over 1,000 steps that way, which is not the um, same thing, not so fast, like it was maybe four kilometers an hour or a little bit more. Um, probably they didn't want to drive too fast and lose their tracker. I don't know exactly uh, how they set it up. But that's another possibility I could put it on my car and you know, be very fit that way without uh, actually walking. So, well, sorry. Um, you've seen it, we can abuse steps. Because of that, and because um, distance is only steps multiplied by the walking strides, we can, uh, we can also abuse distance. And of course, we can abuse the calories and the very active minutes which are displayed on our Fitbit account. Okay, because they all dis depend at the beginning on what the tracker registers as steps. Now, what about running? 
Well, it turns out that um, many people did um, research on those accelerometers and how it was measured. And with an accelerometer, well, we can work out pretty lots of things. For instance, we have here the, the various curves for when we're walking and those there when we're jogging. Basically, you see higher peaks when you're jogging because you kind of put more acceleration. Well, not me, because uh, I'm a very bad jogger, okay? But normal people, it would look like that, probably. You also have some other patterns for somebody sitting down, standing up. When you're standing up, right, you get up, so you have um, high acceleration on the vertical axis, and the vertical axis is on that plot is the y-axis. That's why you have that one there, right? can even do better, you can actually tell, work out what you are doing. So you've got, I've got here patterns for when you're vacuuming, when you're brushing your teeth, right? So with all of that, with only um, an accelerometer getting the tracks on the three axis, of course I can tell if you're walking, if you're running, but I can also tell if you're brushing your teeth. That's cool. So, why would we be doing that? Okay, it's cool to attach one's, um, uh, one's tracker to a fan, but it's maybe kind of a little bit useless. Well, the goal behind it, at least for uh, uh, an attacker or somebody who wants to get something out of it, is to earn those undeserved badges. It's the way I will be able to earn my 5,000 steps badge, my 10,000 steps badge, or something like that. And with that, you can affiliate to various programs uh, from various companies, which will give you kind of po uh, points that you can redeem for various gifts, like a gift card, a $50 gift card, that, that happens. Um, you can get some special discounts for sneakers, sports suit, whatever. And there are plenty of other things that you can get from those. There's, for instance, um, a gambling solution. For instance, um, it's a company called Pact. Well, they say uh, you, you kind of affiliate your tracker to them, and then you say, okay, this morning or today, I'm going to walk 10,000 steps. That's my bet. And you place some money. If you only do like 9,000, well, you lose your bet, you lose your money, and your money goes to the other people who won their bet. If you win your bet, you get your money, plus a little bit of all the, uh, the money that the others uh, who lost their bet. Okay, so you can get some kind of real money out of just um, cheating and getting those undeserved badges. So, that's kind of a motivation for attackers. Of course, there's also money for business. Well, that's pretty obvious, but um, all those affiliation companies which get the data from your fitness trackers, well, they make money out of it. Here we have um, Higgy, which is a, a company who um, affiliates with uh, Fitbit trackers, and they, say, they said, well, we are launching our industry-leading privacy, protected, of course, and secure API. And with that, um, trusted partners on an opt-in basic only to receive health outcomes, activity data from participating users. Right, okay. So there's money for everyone there. To recap, you can hack steps, distance, everything. Um, with an accelerometer, we can do actually more than uh, hacking and tra uh, tracking steps. We can even know if you're brushing your teeth or vacuuming, vacuuming your house. And there's money for everybody there. Um, the legitimate owner of the tracker, an attacker, and also the industry. And when there's money, that's a fact, we know there's, al uh, there's always threats behind it. So, 
Now we're going to investigate, investigate a little bit more the software part of that. This tracker there, um, it only knows Bluetooth. Right. Well, it also knows NFC, but I haven't got any, any uh, NFC device, so I haven't tried with that. But it talks with Bluetooth. So if you want to synchronize your data, you have at some point, you have either like a dongle, this one, a Bluetooth, USB dongle, or uh, a smartphone that knows uh, Bluetooth low energy. And this, those devices will kind of relay um, your synchronized data to the Fitbit servers at the other end. So then what I wanted to do is just to put myself on my laptop and from the laptop here to the fitness tracker, I just want to be able to talk to it, to send messages, to receive messages from it and learn from that to start hacking it. So I wrote uh, a small Python utility to do that and to, to write to it. It's pretty easy because actually you just have to send USB messages to the right endpoint. There's one endpoint for the dongle right there and another uh, endpoint for the tracker. So you send a USB message to the endpoint to the tracker and actually after, after that it goes by Bluetooth to the tracker right there. So we're gonna try uh, try the tool. So, there it is. It's not very fancy as you'll see, but it works. Well, well I shouldn't say that before I try. <laughs> um, first thing, I have to, well, unclaim the dongle so that I can register it with my own uh, stuff. And then, well, we can get some information like on the dongle. Um, two. It gets up there. That's the version of my dongle and its MAC address, okay? Then I'm gonna detect trackers in the room. Well, if some of you have trackers in the front rows, they will probably be detected as well. So all messages with the tracker are always, oh yeah, there's plenty of trackers. So, so, so. Yeah. At least those. And I'll try to put this full screen. And there's another one there. Uh, I think mine is the first one, is this one. The other three, I don't know. Um, the, the RSSE, that means like, uh, I forgot, signal strength, I forgot the R. But the higher it is, the closer it is to my USD dongle, so that, that's quite logical. I have the first one is mine, it's close to that. And then the other ones are like features that those uh, trackers have, right? So now, um, I'm gonna have to select the tracker I want to talk with. Mm -hmm. So which one? Oh. Aha, some of you have put it off, put yours off, and I can't see mine any longer, what's that? Ooh, cool. Um, there, I'll try that. Well, it's a very good test because actually at, um, at work, I only tried with one dongle because the other one, as you can see, I ripped it off. Um, so, there it goes. I'm going to select mine. And now, what can I do? Well, I can, for instance, uh, I can try this. 
So now, you probably won't see it, but this one has the LEDs blink. I'll show you when it's, there it is. I'm not sure you can see it, but there's a few uh, LEDs blinking on my device there. The other thing we can do, we always have to reset it. It's, I'm sorry, it's, all of this stuff is a little bit painful, but otherwise it just says timeout all the time. We can get its uh, data. So I have to select again my tracker, I believe. And we'll try and synchronize the data. So mine this time is the second, number two. And get tracker data. So there it is. So yeah, that's encrypted. Uh, um, encrypted data of all the steps I've been walking. There's pretty, much, pretty a lot this time. Oops, of course I went a bit too far. And um, at the beginning, what's interesting is that I managed to reverse the, at least the header, so I know that I am synchronizing with a flex, and uh, that it's, well, version two, we don't really care, that there's a sequence counter at the beginning, and this is basically uh, like a modal indicator um, of um, uh, which kind of flex, which version number there is. And then you've got the encry encrypted blob, which is encrypted with keys uh, from Fitbit, which contains all the steps and all the activity I've been doing. So that's all. Let's go back to the slides. So all of these uh, messages that you saw that I can send uh, with that kind of small tool, well, I had to reverse everything manually because there's no kind of hacker's uh, documentation, of course, for those devices. So it was pretty long, of course. Um, I managed to uh, reverse like 20 messages for the dongle. They have a different type. And then 24 messages for the tracker with a different type. And then there's the communication with uh, the, the server in itself, the Fitbit servers. This is done uh, through HTTP or HTTPS uh, with an XML communication protocol. And this is pretty easy to, to reverse because you just have to like uh, Wireshark or sniff the, the network tra traffic and see how it's working. But th this isn't really difficult there. So we'll just have a glimpse at what um, tracker packets look like, okay? Uh, I won't be going into the de details of the 24 packets, of course. Um, what happens is that all packets that you send, you send to the tracker, they always start by C0. That's the indicator for this is a tracker packet. Then you've got the command identifier, and 10 in that case, it means get stamp request which means I would like to get the data to synchronize, right? The tracker receives that and will start and respond by, okay, I'm going to start and send you my data, but first it just sends, uh, so this is command identifier 41, start a dump response. Then it sends the dump, that's the encrypted blob that you saw on the utility. And then at the end, it sends another packet to say, okay, I've finished. And you've got also the, the dump size so that you can be sure that you haven't been missing a packet, for instance. There is also a C or C at some point, but uh, I haven't seen any hash, for instance. There we go. Okay, so we can do plenty of things. We can get the information of the dongle. We can we can see how many trackers there are nearby. If you want to come later on and try to synchronize with my tool, uh, do come and see me afterwards. Um, we can have the LEDs there blink. That's great. Now, just imagine if I tell my 
my management, hey, you know, it's great. Uh, I've been working like for three months and um, I'm able to get a few LEDs blink. And uh, well, we can do it with the standard tool, but here I can do it with my own tool. Uh, I'm not sure they'd be impressed, right? So <laughs> we'll try and do a little bit more than that, actually. And actually, when it comes yeah, to satisfying management, um, it would be helpful, actually, if you, man if you could uh, fill in the satisfa satisfaction form. Um, it's really very easy. You've got like a scale, zero, very bad, five, excellent. Be sure that if you put zero, I'll trash it. <laughs> and uh, if you can generate like 1999 instead of five, that would be interesting for me as well. Right. So yeah, the real question I'd say uh, my uh, management would be interested in is rather, uh, well, can this tracker get infected? Okay, I don't know if you know, I, I'm working with Fortinet and I'm a malware analyst there, okay, so this is really what my boss will be interested in. Or if it can't be really infected or if it can, is it able to propagate the malware to other uh, devices? So we worked out um, an infection uh, scenario there. We have an attacker who sends some malicious code to the tracker. The tracker gets infected, right? And then, next time while well, the, the attacker can go away, um, the victim is going to discover at some time, at some point, is going to discover the tracker. It, for instance, if he wants to know um, to synchronize it or something like that. And what's interesting there is that we manage to get all responses from the tracker also contain that malicious code, right? So from now on, whenever the infected tracker is queried for something, well, it will always answer some packets plus the malicious code. And then, well, of course, on the victim's laptop, you can imagine plenty of nasty things that this malicious uh, payload will deliver, uh, like crash the laptop, propagate to another device, something like that. So I'll show you a video of that, because I have not. So, it's this one. So it's really, um, yeah, before I start it, it's really like of, um, a hacker's uh, proof of concept. It's not very visual. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Oops, where is it? Start back. So there it's starting. And I'm going to inject to the tracker some uh, image in it's a malicious code, but it's not for the demonstration purposes. I'm just injecting the string hack your flex, right? And then um, each time I send a command to my tracker, you can see below there that it is always answering the right packet, but also hack your flex, which is uh, which could be the malicious code. Then I decided, okay, I sent plenty of uh, messages and there's always hack your flex there. What happens if I really totally reset my tracker? Can I still uh, see that um, injected code? So yeah, 100% for, for this part. And then now we do a complete reset and we lose a few uh, bytes there, okay? Still recovering like most of it, which is what we're interested in. So we can perhaps put actually the, um, the injected bytes a little bit further on so that we're not losing them. So this is possible uh, because of a 
vulnerability on the tracker, which has been, of course, disclosed to Fitbit and which they said they will be uh, patching very soon. Um, so I won't be disclosing, yeah, exactly how, how it's being done. But still, in that video, you can see that there are a few limitations. First, of course, it's a proof of concept. There was no real malicious code, only just a string being sent and that we see uh, coming back in all packets afterwards. The other limitation I have is that with this technique, I am only able to inject at most 17 bytes. 17 bytes, that's not, um, that's not a lot, right? It would be a little bit short for a full-fledged botnet, of course. But still, uh, I think it's still valuable because if you are old enough to recall like the, the crash pan, uh, Pentium Trojan in 2004, well, it was only four bytes. You received those four bytes on your computer and it would crash, crash it completely. So 17 bytes is really far more than that. The other limitation that we have for now is that I haven't been working on the way to actually execute or deliver the payload on the host. So on the victim, it receives the packet, the infected packet, but it still has to infect it, uh, to infect the laptop or do something on it. This means like exploiting perhaps the USB stack or exploiting the Bluetooth stacks, things like that. That's for some other parts of research to be done there. And of course, then the other limit, of course, is that Fitbit will be patching, so this won't be possible anyway in a few months, probably. Now, some other things we can do with the tracker there. Um, that's like imaging, I don't know, you don't want to use your tracker any longer for sports and you want to do something else with it or imagine that, I don't know, the Fitbit servers are down and you don't know what to do with this tracker any longer. Well, we can use it as a source of entropy. So that's perhaps because uh, I like cryptography, so I first thought, well, you know, we're always lacking a good source of entropy. How about using this tracker there? The way we do it, again, is just having a look at the various messages that we can send to the tracker. There is one message um, which is called like authenticating the, um, the tracker, which is meant to set a bond between the smartphone and the tracker. And for that, well, the dongle or the smartphone is going to send a challenge. The tracker responds the other way with his own challenge and then the dongle is meant to compute a match out of those two, those two uh, random numbers, numbers and that way authenticate towards the tracker. Now, if we just want a random number generator, we are just interested in the second packet, this one, the 51. To get that one, we just send like a very dummy first one, the 50. We don't care, we don't have to generate a local random number, we'll just send always the same one. And then we read the random number that the tracker sends, sends us. And we use that as a source of randomness. Let's try that. Um, yeah, I have plenty of trackers, so. Um, mine is number three, but I actually I could have your trackers work as well. And RNG, that is to get random numbers. So the first few bytes, first eight bytes to get are a bit slow because it has to establish the Bluetooth link to the tracker and then it goes, well, 
I wouldn't call that fast, but fast enough to get some, uh, some random numbers there. Okay? So those are the random numbers that it generates. Now, I'm sure that you wonder, well, okay, those are, they look random, but are they really random? That's really a good question, right? So, well, I tested them. And I tested them uh, with the batteries of tests which are, you know, recommended by the NIST for their own, uh, the, the own uh, random number generators that they want to uh, kind of test. So, there's uh, a tool called ENS which regroup uh, all those uh, first tests, the key square test, the mean test, and the Monte Carlo P test. And then there's another battery of tests which is called D harder. There. And in an ideal world, okay, that's what we are targeting, we would have a random number with a generator with those values there, right? You never get this, of course, because the ideal world is never perfect. And that's what we get for our tracker with my system there. And what we see, I've compared it with some other uh, sources of entropy. So, uh, Victor Hugo, this is French uh, literature, just to see how bad it goes when something is not random, the difference. Um, ciphertext here, well, ciphertext uh, is meant to be pretty much random at the end when it's, you know, encrypted. So, it's also a good way to test, to, to see uh, how a good uh, random output would be. And then you've got some physical events like radioactive decay as, as well to compare with. And, well, the results are a bit difficult to assess because there's no, like, real excellent um, random number generator, but it looks okay. I mean, it doesn't look really worse than what we'd have sta uh, standard on uh, the Linux uh, systems, for instance. So, perhaps I would not be using it for cryptography, but it's not too bad. So yeah, that's all. So just to recap, well, we are able to fool steps and distance count. We can have our LEDs blink. That's great. I like it personally. But we can also have our, uh, we can see that the synchronization data that go to the, uh, the Fitbit servers are encrypted. And I'll be working on that later. Um, we are able to inject 17 bytes on the tracker, which could be pr potentially harmful because we could, we can that way infect our tracker and propagate the infection to other devices. And we are able to use our tracker as a random number generator. And that's it. You've got a few links there if you want to see some more. Um, the tools, my tool will be posted in like a few days, the, the time I get back home. Um, and then if we've got some time for questions, I'll be happy to answer. And if some of you want to try to synchronize their tracker with the tool, it's possible as well. No question, or is it that I don't see the hands up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the question was, uh, is it possible to uh, apply it to other uh, Fitbit trackers? Yes, it is. Um, uh, this work is applicable to any Fitbit tracker as far as I know. Um, I there, there are some specificities for some others, uh, like they don't have the same device type, they don't have uh, the same exactly the same headers. I haven't reversed exactly all of them, but um, yes, they synchronize the same way. You send the messages the same way. Um, it's globally the, the same way to, to communicate with the tracker. They just do have some, for instance, for those with uh, a screen, you have some messages which are implemented on this one but not used. Well, 
on uh, the search, for instance, or on the charge, um, those packets are really useful and do something on the, on the device. Other question? Um, I don't know what they're going to do uh, with that. They told me they would be fixing. Um, I, I talked with them first time. It was in March, March this year. And they told me it was a bug, not a security issue. So I told them, well, I don't mind as long as you fix it. So, um, And they haven't fixed it yet. That's the only thing I know. Well, it's possible to update the firmware. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw in the, in the tool there. I can get the firmware data. Well, except that it's encrypted. Same thing. So um, I can't make all the sense out of it yet. Um, let me show you. Yeah, it's there. Eight. Get the firmware data. So they have the way yeah, to update the firmware. and. Probably that what they will do uh, do it that way, a patch and send a uh, firmware update afterwards to people who who are synchronizing. I guess it's the way they're going to do it. Does uh, that answer your question? Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, it's, I, why have, uh, haven't I tried to hack the firmware? It's because it's encrypted. Um, for now, um, it leaves the tracker there. It leaves it. It's already encrypted. So when I see the bytes on the laptop, it's already encrypted. If I uh, have a look at them on the smartphone, same, it's encrypted. And when I discussed with... Um, the, some Fitbit security engineers, they told me that they indeed they considered the laptop or the smartphone as outside the security enclosure so that they had encrypted it before, which is actually, I guess, a, a good measure. So it's encrypted and for now, uh, I'm not even sure what algorithm they are using. It could be either AES or XT. I am not sure of that. Uh, I haven't been able to locate um, the key they are using either, and for that I need to uh, to inspect the hardware. So that's why at the beginning we started like opening it, and now we have to I get to be, to probe the hardware to to get something. I haven't been able to see anything more with the software. I can ask them for an update, but when I ask for an update, it gets encrypted on my uh, on the tracker. So comparing encrypted data is useless. Uh, yes, I can downgrade. Um, not so sure because there is at the beginning of um, yeah at the beginning of the packets there's a sequence counter. And uh, for instance, I tried some other times to do uh, some replay attacks on steps, like I record uh, every packet that is going to the Fitbit uh, server while I've been doing 10 steps and try to replay that um, with changing the sequence counters correctly, and it did not work. So I guess that it's more than just encryption. There's probably in the encrypted packet either some timer or something more but it's not working if you replay it. So it might not be possible to downgrade for the same reason. So have I tried other brands? No, I have not. Uh, I have been playing with some other um, devices like uh, um, a Sony smartwatch as well, um, but the architecture is completely different. 
uh, it has absolutely no, um, well, yeah, no relationship with the uh, with the tracker. To try other trackers, yeah, could be fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I guess um, that's all. Unless there's another one. Okay. Well, thank you very much for attending. Then.